Testing one, two, three. Everybody here, for two, four, two, four, two, in the air. So if you can, it's Okay, nobody has been able to face up. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, for the first time for some just pulled me down. I don't know that. Thank you. Thank you. Chad and I was thinking, okay, Susan, she puts all these advertisements out for us. Well, this is the uh, Hamilton County Master Garden. And I'm Carol Matthews, the board lady for the Board Center of Devices. And we're very happy to have you here. We do this every third Saturday of the month from January from February. Oh, and, uh, November, however, is the line we make in class. It's the only one that we like so many people for and have to do the on that one. But everything else is open to the public. We also have a Zoom audience. We welcome them this morning. It's like we have a full list of people there, too. And uh, we have a lot of things going on with the Master Gardeners from all over town. Uh, you will find some of the things they listed. If you want to know more about us, you can sign up for our public newsletters, which is what we ask for the email addresses back there, and you'll get that once a month and you where we are, what photos we're sponsoring, and so forth. We just finished hosting the regional conference for the Indian State of Tennessee here in Chattanooga for the Master Gardeners. And that was last weekend. And so we were very uh, privileged to have them to come here to Chattanooga to have that conference. And then September the 30th, right here on the grounds, right here, will be our fall festival. And we will have quite a number of And we will have uh, quite a number of vendors out here for various things. Uh, it won't be as big as the expo that we have ever had. It will be a mini expo. There will be flat vendors and things here. We will also have a full lot of demonstrations this year. Um, also, even than what we have had at the expo, and they'll be up on the hill. We'll have... So, if you need anything, and we'll send it. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we do. Today we have a very special uh, person to be a speak for us. She is a um, she does our Zoom coordinating, and uh, she uh, it's Lee Anderson. She uh, ha we have a project down at the Chattanooga Zoo, and uh, we have a group of people that go down there, and uh, she helps them put the right plant in the right place, like. You know, desert plants should not be in the jungle section of the zoo and so forth. And they go down there and they do a lot of that and they help with the zoo educational things that they have down there as well. So uh, she is very good and has been for years working with the Azalea as well as Indians and Millions. We call her Millions, that's for sure. But that's the lovely plants. And uh, we will uh, turn this back out, turn this over and let her tell you all about it. 
Okay. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, she's uh, wrong about being an expert. I do know more about the new. I do know more about camellias than I do these other three plants, but I'm learning just like I hope you are. And that's why I decided to broaden, expand on these plants because I love these plants too. And I have them, but uh, I don't know as much about them because I didn't take any, I didn't take azaleas, I didn't take rhododendron specifically and start studying or researching, but I did with camellias. So you'll probably notice a difference when we get to camellias, but anyway. But I am uh, trying to learn more about them. What is this right here? Okay. What's the next one? Rodelia. Next one. And then, yeah. Uh, these are beautiful plants, aren't they? And the, I've got a sample, <laughs> a very mini little tiny sample of gardenias up here from my, I just picked them this morning, but they're so tiny. But the plant is only this big. And I transferred it from my last yard. I just moved recently. And um, moving in this heat, moving any plants at all is a miracle that they live and survive. And I moved a couple of camellias. I hated leaving what I had because, you know, when you talk about, uh, mature plants and I know one lady I don't know if she's here or not because I don't know who she, what she looks like but she uh, sent me an email about air layering familias you heard that before well <clears throat> I always talk about propagating but she was talking about that and, and I haven't really you know studied and done any of that any of the air layering but um, I am going to try it one of these days but um, it's it's like you know, these plants right here, I split them. In fact, I split I split a big, you know, it was big, kind of full. I guess I should say not about big this way. But anyway, and so this is what I got. But I mean, most of the time, you don't see any blooms right now on uh, gardenias or anything, but occasionally do. And we've had some cool mornings, as you know. So, um, you know, you might find some blooms. How many of you in here have these plants? Okay, are the rest of you thinking about maybe looking at them, getting them? Okay, well, what's that? They aren't? Okay, uh, well, we'll talk about some ways that's hopefully, you know, gain from this. Um, okay, so, let's see, where, where is the, oh, <laughs> Got to look at that before. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, if you go to a nursery or anywhere you buy a an azalea, we're going to talk about them first. What do you see? You see that word rhododendron, right? It's a member of that family. So don't. They differ enough from the road, rhodos, and I'm going to call them rhodos, is for short, uh, but they prefer a lot of the same culture. In fact, all of these plants do. They have a lot of the same, you know, they like a lot of the same environment. Two types of azaleas, evergreen and deciduous. And what I can say about that, if you like having green all the time, you want which one? You want the evergreen, right? The deciduous are nice. A lot of times you'll see the wild azaleas, and, and those are deciduous. They're going to lose their leaves uh, in the in the winter. So think about where you'll be planting, because if you want them in front for show, in front of your house, you don't want to get deciduous. You want to get the evergreen. Um, but you can find out the nurseries. They usually have some of both. Um, they have some low growing varieties too that I like. And uh, there was a white one I saw at Farm Nursery recently that was just absolutely gorgeous. I, I meant to write, it's kind of a funny name to the two. I'm gonna go back 
I always say, if I go back and it's still there, it was meant for me to get it. That's how I look at plants. Um, but because I think about it, think about it, think about where I'm going to you know, plant it, because that's important. But before you do any kind of planting, you should know your soil. If you don't know your soil, what kind of soil you have, you're going to be in trouble with any like this because they need a rich soil. So you need to amend it if you have that clay, which most of us do. If you're going to plant it up close to your front of your house, just keep in mind the border. Things it's not good for them to be right next to the house because of the mortar and the heat that it gets. But you can amend the soil to where it will do well. And uh, so don't forget about that when you're when you're looking to buy where you want to plant it and the type of soil you have is very important. <clears throat> so uh, they do near they do well near water. Now I'm not near water, but I thought this was interesting in case you live near water. Uh, and they do great in the oriental, oriental style gardens because their branch structure can be guided into horizontal planes. So in pots, have you ever bought a uh, have you bought an azalea from a nursery before? You ever done? I mean, not a nursery. Excuse me, from a florist. Anybody? Well, I got one sent to me. And it was beautiful. It's evergreen. It's always an evergreen in the forest. But they're not going to have the decisions. Right? Um, and I was so proud of it. And I love gardening. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. It wasn't a azalea. It was a gardenia. I'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, the gardenia is evergreen, certainly from, from a uh, forest. But I planted it outside eventually because I, I don't do well with house plants. I'm an outside plant. So it lived. And that's the plant that I transferred over. I mean, it's amazing. You know, I was really happy about that. <clears throat> they prefer good light, but protection from direct sun and forceful drying wind. And I can tell you that all of these shrubs fit that exactly right there. There are some exceptions, though. And that picture right there is actually from the masters in Augusta, Georgia. Isn't that beautiful? All those azaleas. Has anybody ever been to the masters in here? Well, I've been several times. But my dad was a ticket holder for 50 years. So I got the enjoyment of admiring all their azaleas. And the 10th hole is the camellia hole. So they named all their holes a different flower. So it's nice. Well-drained, moisture retentive, but if you use any peat moss or anything like that, you need to make sure you use a coarse peat moss so it won't clump up and dry out and stick, it'll stick together once it's dried in. So you can use it, it's good, but you want to make sure it's mixed in. Don't use a fine peat moss because it will, it will be made. Um, but you want to make sure that whatever you amend your soil with has plenty of nutrients. And I suggest that you always use one of these. Um, I use this quite often when I get bird by bird alone. It's a root stimulator. You want to make sure you use a root stimulator when you plant these plants. It'll give them a good start. In fact, any plant, uh, like a tree starting out, very important to use a root stimulator. That we'll talk a bit more about that. Um, <clears throat> they're shallow rooted. How many of you knew that? Yeah, that's pretty pretty obvious isn't it, when you pull them out of the pot. And when you pull them out of the pot, keep in mind, uh, sometimes if you can't tell by just looking at the the foliage on the you know the top, you know you can't. You, you, it's sort of difficult. To take a plant out of the pot in a nursery, and they go by and they go, oh, "Ma'am, please don't, you know, like a little kid or something." Uh, but what happens when you pull the plant out of the pot? What do you see? What you see it kind of matted up, don't you? Sometimes it depends. 
not not always. So if it comes out easily, it's that's a good sign. That's a that's a good plus. But if it's really wrapped around it, you're going to have to loosen it up before you put it in the hole. Keep that in mind. If it's matted really badly, you want to take a knife and trim off the bottom. If it's a one gallon pot, about a half an inch. Okay, at least loosen it up. It won't hurt to trim it off a little bit all the way around. If it's a three gallon or large or two gallon or larger, you can go as much as an inch. But most of the time, all you have to do is loosen it up. But you want to loosen it up good all the way around. Okay, before you put it in that one. And uh, and then, of course, the same thing applies as anything. You want to after you put it in, you know, dug your hole and how big you dig your hole. That's what's recommended. And why is that recommended? Does anybody know hear the answer to how to pick the hole in? Did you hear that? Uh, Twenty inches. Twice. Yeah, she she said just twice the size of the pot. Yeah, and that's all the way around. Keep in mind, not just one way, <laughs> you know. That's um, why do you do that? How do, how, do, how do roots grow? These roots on these plants, for sure. I can't speak for flowers exactly. They grow out. They grow down, they grow out. So you've got to give them some space. So they have to have, you know, be able to grow out and be able to have somewhere to go. So that's important. They have growth buds, these azaleas, all along their stems. And right now, you should see some growth buds on your azaleas. And uh, <clears throat> they need little pruning other than removal of weak or dead wood. If you see anything like that, you can go ahead and prune that. But when do you prune on azaleas? After they've bloomed, yes. I went by my old house, try not to do that. <laughs> and I saw the azaleas, and they're so much, they were beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I they turned out so well, but they did. But they got big and tall and, you know, branched out. And I love the natural. If you can leave your plants like these in the natural rather than trimming them up in a ball. You know, that's not good. That's not good. I'll just tell you right now. And I've seen some neighbors do it. But, you know, it does, it's nothing wrong with pruning. But you want to make sure you do it after they've lost their blooms and well before the summer, okay? Because in summer on, they start setting their buds. You, you can't even see them sometimes, but just know they're working on it. And right after they bloom, you know, or you need to start giving them the fertilizer a little bit, just a little bit, not not big on that, but at least a little. Can I ask a question about yeah. the picture? It looks like there's trees um, where these A's are. Is that a good thing? That is excellent. And guess what kind of trees they are? This is at the master's office. The pines, yes. So they love the pine. So we're going to make a few Okay, uh, excuse me, just one second. She asked, um, what are the trees in this picture here? And they are pine trees. And is that a good thing uh, for the azaleas? It's excellent. Having a tree canopy is great for all of these plants right here. Um, they do very well under a tree canopy, but now they've got to get a fair amount of light to produce good blooms and keep on blooming. So you, you, if your trees above, if you've got them like this, I guarantee you, <laughs> these gardeners here, they make sure that they're getting the right everything at the masters you can bet on that. Um, so yes, that's a good question. Okay, uh, if you want a compact plant rather than one that is open and regular, you can cut back some of the thicker limbs. What you can do is, you know, when you when you look, get to know your azalea, look in it and see if it needs cutting some in there to get light to some of the other part of the plant, especially if it's a pretty good size, because they'll get pretty thick sometimes and they need to be thinned out a little bit. Okay. 
So that's what that's talking about. And a lot of people, I've got a good friend. In fact, I've got some pictures of her garden, her flowers, azaleas. She uh, moves around. She keeps azaleas in pots sometimes and just treats them into pots, big old huge pots, and moves them around on the, the little wagon of, in her yard to see where they would best you know, fit. And that's a good thing to do too. That saves you some labor. Because uh, if you plant them in the wrong place and they don't do well, you you know you've lost the plant, lost money, you know, time invested. So <clears throat> the encore. How many of you like the encore azaleas? The encore are, uh, as in the name, they bloom again, and and actually, we've got several of them. And I decided at one point to quit buying the Encore and just buy the traditional because the traditional has such full, it's like a full shrub of flowers on it, the traditional ones do. Have you ever noticed that? Now we have the Encore and you look back at the, the traditional. But then when I started studying Encore, I changed my mind. Because the reason they came, this guy uh, came up with the Encore. I forgot his name. Yeah, Robert Lee. He envisioned Encore Zayas in the 1980s. That's about when, you know, after that we started seeing him. <laughs> he crossed traditional spring blooming with rare Taiwan summer blooming Azaleas. And everything comes from Japan. So, so are you. And what he noticed, he had a trade of cut azaleas, just some limbs cut, okay? And he left them in his nursery and got plenty of light and they started blooming. And they, you know, they just started blooming from the cuttings. And so he thought, hmm, something to that. So that's why he did the crossing. And <clears throat> that's how they came up with the young core of azalea with the traditional. So if you want blooms, more blooms later on, and I'll tell you this one plant I bought, because like I say, I moved three months ago, so I'm starting over in my yard. My yard had nothing in it, which is kind of nice in a way. Um, but anyway, the the uh, Encore Azalea, I have one in particular, and I've got another one that's kind of that peppermint. Have you seen that? The peppermint stripes Azalea? Well, the one is, is pink, just plain pink, and it blooms. It has been blooming for two months. And I mean, in this heat, it's been blooming. I've got it in a little bit of shade. It gets a little bit of shade during the day, and it gets the sun. Remember, it's got to have a certain amount of sunlight to produce those blooms and for them to keep blooming and set. Okay? So, full sun, the part shade, I like to say, shaded too full. Um, the morning, if they can get the morning sun, any of these plants can get the morning sun versus the afternoon sun, I think you're better off. I really do. Because it's, it's harder in the day, as you know. But no more than four hours direct. And remember, azaleas, unlike rhododendrons, azaleas can take the sun. They can take them. The, the rhododendrons can't, but the as they just can. So uh, if you do have them in a sunny place, and quite honestly, uh, my mother had some at her house in the, right out in the, you know, and you find flame azaleas and some of those wild azaleas out, and they just do great. So too much shade may reduce the bloom cycles. Now, uh, what about this summer? Uh, was it, it's pretty hot, wasn't it? Or it has been up until just what, a couple of weeks ago, really. I hope you were watering pretty regularly. If you put in azaleas and you, you know, you really love the plant, the shrub, and then you forget it, what happens? It may, it may not make it. Uh, it may be where you have it that it lives. Maybe it really likes where it lives and it had, you had good soil that you put in, but you've got to water. And I'm just going to say you have to water more than just azaleas. You've got to water everything. And I'm sure everybody's been doing that. 
but you've got to keep that up a couple times a week at least if we have no rain. So rain is best for them, but I use a rain barrel. Now my rain barrel is growing because I've used it up. So wait for it to rain, get filled up again. But watering because the leaves will, you see them turning yellow on some of your plants. Sometimes that's saying, hey, they're not getting enough water. Sometimes it's saying you're getting too much water. It's, it's difficult. You have to play around with it. That's why it, pay, it pays to know your plants. Pest and disease. Uh, some of the pests include on azaleas, they affect rodent. So leaf miner, stem borer, spider mites, and scale. Um, the I have to refer to the notes here on that, which is what, but on the leaf miner, that is it attacks the leaf tissue. There's larva, larva that attacks the leaf tissue. And then on stem borer, that damages, that gets down into the uh, limbs, I mean, the, the actual stem itself and starts eating, you know, really the larva starts eating the wood and stuff. So what you can do sometimes on those is just irrigate it really good. You know, spray with your hose kind of lightly over the whole plant. Sometimes that, that will attack them and get rid of them. Uh, a scale, if they get scale, you want to use a horticulture spray. And this is one right here that's safe. Insecticidal soap. Just make sure you can. Yes. Oh, excuse me. Here it is. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'm not pushing any brand, I'll be honest with you, because this is brand new for me. And I have used it some. It seems to be okay. I had a full container of insecticidal. It was a bigger container of insecticidal soap. I've been using it for a long time, and I thought I better grab some, some more soap. I would have preferred to get exactly what I had, but I couldn't find it. But this is for flat says for flowers, fruit, and vegetables uh, up to the day before harvest. So keep in mind, you know, you don't want to go hog wild on the sprays now. I'm telling you, none is better than some in some cases. So, uh, but it contain it'll control rust, powdery, powdery mildew, and black spot. And that's what I used it on some of mine just recently for. Had some black spots. Did you have a question? Okay. All right. Could you, could you ask someone? Yes, be glad to. Leaf gall. I don't have a picture of leaf. It's just a picture, but it's not up there. But I'm going to show you that. Um, that's the one that really. That really attacks leaf gall, really attacks the camellias when we get to that. But I want to show you since it's mentioned up here. I'll pass this around. This is a weird looking thing, but it doesn't kill your plant. You just need to remove it. And keep in mind when you remove aphids, anything like that, you want to dispose of them in the trash. Put them in a bag, put them in the trash. Don't put it in your compost. Uh, sometimes you may have to even remove your uh, mulch that you have, put down clean mulch, you know, if it's, it's diseased heavily or you notice it's a real problem. So changing out the mulch is a lot cheaper than rooting the plant. Okay, uh, petal blight, that's a, an example here. Um, jumping off the will, will, sometimes it's, it's just a a matter of maybe too much watering, not enough. You have to experiment. It, it takes some experimenting. Okay, if a soil uh, acidity is seven, that's alkaline. So you know it needs to be between four and six on all four of these shrubs here. Okay, anything like even hydrangeas, like you know, prefer the acid. I give them coffee grounds all the time. And I also give some of these other plants coffee grounds. That's, a, that's an approved uh, fertilizer, actually. So think it about your coffee. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, okay. She says uh, her comment is it also the uh, coffee grounds also kill the slugs. You got slugs around. I think we all probably all do. And uh, also, yeah, in talking about slugs, it also cures fire ants. Yeah. Yes. How much coffee ground? Well, okay, she wanted to know how much coffee grounds can you use. <laughs> I don't have that much at one time. So what I do is I save them in an old coffee can, you know, day after day, you know, because I make coffee every day. And uh, so I save them and I put the whole piece of paper out there because it's got so much on it. But I just lay the coffee grounds kind of close to, you know, where it can kind of seep in uh, and then a little bit of water over that because that's the thing that we forget sometimes when we put fertilizer in. We need to make sure it gets to what? It's got to get to the roots. If you lay it on top, it's not going to, it's going to maybe eventually get there if we have a little rain, but you need to work it in. So the same way with coffee grounds, because we're treating it like a fertilizer. So does that answer your question? No. Can you still use it if it, if it starts if it only? If it starts what? Worldly. Uh, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, I know what you're exactly what you're talking about because my brother used to do that. And I'd look at his coffee grounds and go, hey, you're not going to put that on your plants on you. I would, just wouldn't take any chances. You don't want to add any negative. And the hope is it's negative. Okay, watch over watering, watch over fertilizing. Like I said, if you remember nothing else I tell you, don't fertilize the heck out of your plants because that will. Be bad. Um, all right. Getting into rhododendrons. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. About over fertilizing. So, where can after the first? Well, yeah, after they bloom, you want to, that's when you want to start, after they, they're done blooming, you want to start getting in with the fertilizing. Okay. So, you want to do it no more than twice a year on these type of plants. Yes. Unless you had come up with a problem. Now, uh, a man at uh, recently at Bar Nursery was telling me that he was having a plant uh, a problem with his Japanese maple, and uh, he said he he bought he bought this particular brand, uh, and he and I bought it because it wasn't very expensive, um, and I'm going to try it with my Japanese maple. I'm going to dig around it and get this down in there. It's a root tone is what it is. Also, I learned from the a woman named Linda at the Signal Mountain Nursery. She, if you ever go there, look her up, Linda. She's very informative about, you know, plants and all. She's worked there 30 years. But she said to put, if like the cold spill we had last year, she started going around and putting root tone all around her plants that she worried about. And she said that they're all doing well now, especially her, you ever heard of Paris? The Mountain Snow Paris? Paris. No. Uh, I've got some down at the zoo, but, um, but they, didn't, they didn't make it. One didn't make it through that cold, but, but the other one's okay. But she said it's finally coming back because she lost, Topsy lost it all together, but it's coming back now. So, okay, so then I do it like for lines of May. And you would be my second. Well, before, before August, because they start setting buds. We'll get into that. They'll start setting buds. And if you don't want to put fertilizer on them, they're starting to set buds. No, leave them alone. You don't want to do any pruning, pruning either. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that couple times, you know. All right. There are about 900 rhododendron species. And uh, 
they are all over in their native habitats up in the mountains and hills and all the places they love to be in their natural habitat. Um, this one differs from the azalea. Uh, remember I said because it doesn't like the heat like the uh, azaleas can tolerate. So you have to find a place in your yard that's been, and hopefully you have a place, maybe a canopy to me would be perfect, like it had for the azaleas on the pictures, um, would be perfect for these. I don't have a canopy. In fact, my yard didn't have but one tree in it. And when I moved there, and it's not a new, new house either, built in 2004, but I found it had been rented. So nobody spent any time on the yard, I guess, that lived there. But anyway, so the soil wasn't amended. And don't underestimate the power of oak trees. I'm telling you, oak trees are good. <laughs> and that's the number one tree recommended by UT in planting. Lots, they can be a lot of maintenance. And when I lived at my former address, I went, oh, these leaves were driving me crazy. I did not realize how valuable those leaves and all were the trees until I moved to where I live now. I only moved because I needed one little house for my mom, who's 94. Uh, yes. Okay. So, and oak trees. I never heard of them. I just heard of trees up in the bed. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about how valuable were oak trees and what what were the other trees? The oak trees and what? Oh, okay. How valuable they are, like I was saying. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'll tell you what, it amends the ground, it amends the soil. I mean, it is they are wonderful. And I like I said, when I moved. I dug, I just about broke my back digging in the present yard because it's so awful. Rock, 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 rock. Can you know? The first place, the white oak. The one from the teenage and maybe those slick leaves. Don't plant those. Those trees drop leaves and stuff. We moved recently. And this is what I've got. Yeah, it's a constant. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do because I have some of those too. Yes, don't do the white oats, is what Carol is saying. Okay, yes, no, uh, and, and I'm not saying go out and buy oak trees and plant them in your yard so they can mend the soil, it's just that the soil was so much better in my former yard because of the leaves and all, you know, I I would let, let, let the whole yard get full and I, I would bow them and just crunch them up so they could you know, be some good, good uh, bulbs, you know, and I plant, I put them on my flowers and everything. And then I piled uh, my uh, pine bulbs or, or uh, pine straw on top of that, you know, so it worked pretty well together. Okay, on rhododendrons, Pretty much the same thing as azaleas. Um, like I said, you've got to consider where you're going to plant them. That's the most important thing, I think, on rhododendrons. A lady at Bar Nursery told me that I was looking to see if they had anything blooming. I went out looking to see if they had anything blooming in these plants and work. But anyway, she said, well, they we found out they started blooming at 55 degrees because they were in a Hoover truck, you know, and she said it took 55 degrees to give them the bloom. So, <laughs> you know, we're not quite down that far yet. Yes. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Wanted to know. I said I talk about Murphy's a lot, but do I buy any, any other place? Yes, I do. More than you can imagine. I don't go all these nurses, uh, you know, sometimes I go for advice and see what they have if I can't find it at the big box stores or whatever. But a lot of times you get some little bit more information at some of the nurseries, you know, than you do the other places. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not advocating 
any certain place to buy them. But the main thing is know what you're looking at and touch it, you know, see if it's turning yellow already or brown or whatever, and you know, put it back. So, um, you want, yes, sir. Can I throw in a question? What about bare roots in online? Well, I've ordered quite a few plants online. I haven't had any problems except with one, and I can't even remember what that was now. But that. yeah, just getting the roots only. Well, usually, I mean, I mean, it has something above it, right? The foliage, a little bit of foliage or anything. Oh, okay. Well, I don't have a lot of experience with that then. Be honest about it. I've, I've ordered a lot of plants and they've been pretty small uh, on the internet and they've they've come in very healthy. I have to say, I haven't had any problems. If you get plants from the harbor day, send it to the class, you're Yeah, that's right. It's, you, yeah. yeah. The river and the song that they and I don't know, just go on from there. So they get a certain and they make it and then certain now. Yeah, that's when I put them You get a different one from Yeah. You can't control the ground, but you can control the trees. You can move them, like you said, put them around places to be sure they're getting the sun. But uh, anything that's really going to smile in a place, I don't know why. There's and especially if you go to springtime, because of the best time to plant the bushes and trees, the harvest is the gifts. Yes, the fall. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Yeah. Carol was just saying to, you know, on these plants you order on the internet, uh, you want to try maybe put them in pots first. I've done that too, some of that. Um, but I have a little garden I built in the back, in my backyard. and. I, it was ready for plants, so we just put them right in. Um, it was actually sort of like a, I feel like a rain garden because I had a lot of, had a problem with that, you know, with the water standing and stuff. So that's what I did before. Okay, so make sure the rhododendrons are well aerated. How do you achieve that? What are some things you can do in your soil? Perlite, you've heard of perlite? Okay, that's something. That peat ball and things like that. Anytime, I mean, they've got to be able to have some air around them in their, you know, in their root system and all to do well. And all of these plants like that, actually. So I use about the same thing, same kind of uh, soil mixing. And, you know, <clears throat> whatever you dig out to dig your hole, you want to put some of that back in because hey, that's what you've got in your yard, you know, wherever you're planting. So you, you kind of mix it with the other stuff, you know, just mix it up. All right. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, in suggestion, uh, you can use cotton seed meal on the rhododendrons. And I got this from Guyton and the rhododendron nursery. And you have to get that, though. Okay. Okay. You the the comment here is you can use cottonseed meal and you have to get it from a an agriculture supplier, uh, but that's good on your rhododendrons. It's very good, Anna. Thank you. All right. They need cool, moist soil, this well drained, like all of these, pretty much, but even more so for the rhododendrons. Acid soil here again at 4.5 to 6. It's about where you want to be with all four of these. Uh, shelter from the wind and excessive sun. Cool, humid atmosphere does well. They're shallow rooted again. There you see that word. And um, you got to get as close as you can to their, you know, their habitat at adaptation. But it's hard to achieve if you don't live up on Signal Mountain or somewhere where you can really, well, they thrive. When I was at visiting the Signal Mountain Nursery, they they uh, they were telling me they they sell a lot of them up there because it's a good environment for them. Uh, but you don't you know mine are living, mine are doing very well, and they're in Rossville, Georgia. 
and uh, you know, way off the mountain. So uh, it just you've got to work with them a little bit, and they've all got buds on them right now too. Sometimes soon. Uh, this is interesting. The underside of the plant leaf, which has it has minute hairs that retard transfer transpiration during the dry spells. Rhododendrons do that right underneath their leaf. You well, can't see them, but uh, that's a pretty good little self self fix right there. <clears throat> okay, wild rhododendrons. Uh, my mom had some of these, and they will usually be the dominant plant if you see them out somewhere in the country or park. Or uh, they uh, do well, like I said, under the tree canopy because that eliminates that sunburn. And don't mistake, plants do burn, their leaves will burn. And uh, so will your Japanese maple, by the way. <laughs> uh, Best planting and bloom time is early spring for transplant. Um, I transplanted both of mine in the middle of this heat because of the timing when I moved. I wanted those rhododendrons. And I brought them with me and I worried about them, but they're just as, they look just like they were in my old place. Um, I just hope they, they do as well. In the soil well drained, uh, moist, not saturated, don't want to saturate anything, uh, especially on camellias and leaves. Uh, good peat moss will last in soil for a number of years before it completely breaks down. <laughs> so that's that stuff that, you know, will help with the aerating and all, but, but I like that perlite too, that they, you see those little white beads, you know, in pots when you buy them sometimes. That's for air, get air. Uh, they suggest on this to you, you probably have better luck instead of getting a one gallon, uh, get it about a three gallon. Most people probably do that anyway, but you know, it depends on what you what you want to spend and that kind of thing. Uh, but choose a dapple shade spots, keep that in mind. Isn't that pretty? I love that. The rest of the ones are more popular than others, too. Keep, uh, when you when you buy a plant at a store, nursery, wherever you get it. What do you do with that pot? Do you go plant it immediately? How many will testify to that? <laughs> or do you set it aside and say, I'll plant this a bit later? And then two days go by and you still haven't planted it. Then a week. <laughs> and then is when you look at those matted they, they're matted at the story where you bought it, and then they're even more matted where you set it. If you do that, it's not a total, you know, bad thing, but be sure, keep it watered, and then keep it in the shade until you plant it. If you put it out in the hot sun, it's going to really dry out, and, you know, it, it can damage it a little bit. So keep it in the shade until you plant it, okay? That's important. Um, some I, I got a I ordered an oak tree recently on the internet. It's a it's a a dwarf oak tree they've come out with. I wish I had brought the name of it to give to you, but anyway, um, it's because the size of my yard can't handle the huge ones, and I want an oak tree. So. Um, they said on there, uh, you know, if you don't plant it right away, you can plant, you can wait up to two to three weeks or even longer if you want. Because a good time to plant trees is really in the late fall. You don't, it's got to get that good root system with all our plants, really. Um, be careful because it's got to get, you know, it's got to go the whole winter building up its root system and all that so they'll live and be healthy. Um, Watering, go by the plant location, climate, sunshade, presence of absence of bulbs, and that kind of thing. If you see some drooping, it's probably a sign it needs some water. Uh, make sure your mulch covers the soil surface completely and put more mulch on there than you think it needs. You know, put add more mulch, um, give it a little thickness. But when you mulch, if you ever, you ever go by and see these 
streets that have trees lined up all the way down the sidewalk and next to the sidewalk and they they have the mulch looks like a pyramid under it. Volcano. Yeah, a volcano. <clears throat> That's a no-no. What happens when it rains? It rolls right off. So you've got to move your mulch back a little bit, even in your own yard, your own plants, so that rain can get down in there to those roots. That's where you need it. Also, insects will attack the bark in, in that mulch above. Yes, yes, they will. That's a, that's a good one. Insects, insects will attack the mulch too in that bark and work that uh, stem. So be very careful about that. Um, Fertilizers may be necessary as supplements, but um, a lot of recommendations I researched said that it's not even good to fertilize a plant when you first buy it and plant it. It's better to wait about a year. Um, so I have read that, but it, I, I'm telling you, do your own research and ask because it pays to do that uh, for what that particular plant that you're purchasing or whatever because you don't want to you want to do the right thing. Pruning, I don't know who would be pruning. I don't think about pruning on my rhododendrons, but because I think they're pretty just you know, but if you have a, a you know the wherever you have a planted and it and it can't take the huge plants so you have to prune them back. But you can you can Take the terminal leaf bud on the stem. This is not a real good, of course, but the main stem pinch that off, and they will help that legginess. They'll get fuller. In other words, I don't have that problem with mine. In fact, I've got four. Looks like four main stems on mine on each one of my plants, and uh, I'm assuming that's a good thing because they're full, and they're you know. So I don't need to do any terminating, but um, you can do that for it to fill in. And you have to do it, kind of keep it up for a little while. Um, chlorosis is those pale leaves. Um, I haven't seen too many with that, but um, they get a little bit pale. And uh, brown patches, just like all the other plants. Wind burn and salt injury. They'll, they will get some brown margins occasionally. But it's nothing that's going to kill them, you know, just... Put your insecticidal or your watering that it needs or whatever. You just have to inspect them and figure out what it is. Um, failure to bloom or low production of the blooms. Uh, shade. Remember, it's got to have a certain amount of sunlight, just like the others, and uh, to set buds for the following spring. So not too much sun on those rhododendrons, especially though. All right, now we're into chameleons. I'm free at last. Okay. <laughs> On my camellias, um, I had spoke first time on camellias at a, uh, I mean, I was nervous as I'll get out to these because it's such a beautiful plant. And all of these are, that's why I love them. But on camellias, I went around in St. Elmo because I have a friend of his over there, and she went with me. We went door to door and I knocked on the door and asked them if I could have some cuttings. Because I wanted to take these cuttings, you know, so everybody could see them through this workshop. Okay. This was several years ago. But anyway, some of the doors I knocked on, I would, you know, I would ask them and say, hi, how are you doing? Can I, you mind if I have some cuttings from your millions? Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> They didn't know what they had. Man, and you know, the one reason why I chose camellias as my favorite, I guess, to speak about is because it's a, such a, tra you know, it goes way back, like all of these do, you know, from Japan, Asia area. But they have sort of been not talked about for a long time. You think, Anna, you got some camellias? Yeah. And, you know, so people have them, but didn't hear much of them, okay? Unless you remember the American Camellia Society and that kind of thing. So uh, 
when I went in to speak that first time with all my cuttings, I mean, I had a bunch of bouquets of camellias. The first thing a person said to me was, where do you get roses this time of year? Because <laughs> this was in October. And I said, they're not roses. <laughs> they are, no, excuse me, it wasn't in October. It was in April. Yeah. And uh, they, they were probably, for the most part, Japonicus. Japonica to me is because they last longer. And we'll get into that. But I, I thought that was funny because that's why they're called the Rose of Winter. They look like roses in some cases. So, um, but they're, they're a real, uh, you know, and they used to, there's a Camellia sinensis that was used for tea. Those leaves were used for tea. And, um, and they still, you know, harvest that. And then uh, the, the seeds, you can plant seeds, but this is a fairly slow growing shrub. And once it gets up there, you think, gosh, I would never get, you know. But all those camellias I've left in the last three homes, I'm sure they're, I mean, they're all mature now. You know? And uh, now I'm starting over. But anyway, um, they're, I think they're a real joy because when nothing else is blooming in the winter, and you can look outside and see these camellias blooming. You get, and the cuttings are just wonderful. The cuttings bring them in, enjoy them inside. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Can you hold that thought? thought? We're going to talk about one day in December. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they used the seeds for oil. That was some time ago. And this, this one camellia called Alba Plena. That is still around, and I see it occasionally. It is, it's a showy camellia, and a very popular. If you if you like camellias, um, and if you live in if you're an Alabama fan, that's the state flower. <laughs> so, uh, but there's about eighty species, but only four that are important to the gardening public, and important sense. <laughs> Say, but anyway, you've got Japonica, Sasanqua, the Reticulata, and then you've got that Sinesis. Okay, but the two that you will find in this area without having to order online are the Japonica and the Sasanqua. And the Sasanquas are the hardier, the hardiest as far as sun. They can tolerate sun. Okay. Japonica's do as well. All right. The Sasanquas, now that's called a Yuletide, and I have that in my yard. And uh, let's see if I, if I can show it. I have a picture because I sent it for the, the paper called some of the Master Gardeners last December when all this cold hit. And if yeah, you can. This is how it looks now, and uh, but this is how it did look, okay, before that cold day. So you can see it's a little fuller than it is in this picture, but it's come back. So that's a good thing. And then this other one, it's a Japonica. I think it's called Perfection, Pink Perfection. And it bloomed after I moved it to my new place. And I just thought it was going to die. I really did because, you know, the heat, everything was going against it. The moon, just the transplanting, nothing else. And all of a sudden, and I'm talking in May, May, that flower that you'll see passed around came out on it. One flower. I mean, it's like I got a million dollars that day. So... Uh, never underestimate what your students can do. All right, the bloom zone Sasanquas. This is how you can tell the difference. If you have a Sasanqua and they start blooming, they drop in petals. The Japonicas drop whole flower. 
So that's how you can tell which is which. If you walk out or even somebody else's yard or whatever in there, you see the whole, whole flower on the ground, that's a japonica. The sasanquas will be in petal drops, okay? Now, these are the harbingers of the season. I mean, they're like the azalea season. They just bloom, they're prolific. They bloom and bloom and bloom in their season, and they get full, okay? But they're a little more shallow, and that's why they drop by petals. They drop by um, the, where the japonicas are a lot fuller, and uh, you'll see here in just a second what I'm talking about. <clears throat> They range in color from white through pink to red and all flower forms. And uh, the sasanquas make nice hedge plants. Uh, if I was going to use them as a hedge, and I wouldn't mind doing that, I still would not cut them like people cut hedges. I would let them, maybe just a little trim to keep them, uh, but not much. They can be a spaye. You know what that is, everybody? Okay, you see um, people doing this with magnolias. It's the first thing I saw, espalier. It's E-S-P-A-L-I-E-R, but it's, it's kind of funny pronounced. But they are flat against a wall, trellis, something. My friend in Memphis has two espalier magnolias. They are actually pretty. They bloom like crazy. You know, growing like that. I did an espalier with my yuletide. I got a yuletide camellia just like that one, just to do that with to see if it would go. It was doing very well, but I didn't have a wall I could put it on. So I put it on a kind of a flat trellis. I kind of doubled it up and made it flat. And it did very well. And then when that cold hit, it completely died. So I hated that. That was the only thing. So Okay, they can grow as high as 20 feet. Now, I have a guy that I worked with, you know, I used to work at Drove Tech, and then I, when I retired at 17, they asked me to come work at Peak, uh, at Aztec, but that's kind of the mother plant. And uh, <clears throat> this guy I was working with there said, Oh, uh, Miss Lee, uh, I've got some camellias at my house, and they're, uh, he says, I just need to know what to do. Like, when do I trim them? And I said, well, how tall are they? And, and I, at that time, I didn't know whether they were Sasanquas or Japonicas. Japonicas get taller normally than Sasanquas, but Sasanquas can get tall too. But anyway, I said, how tall are they? And he said, about 30 feet. He said, they're above my house. And I said, oh my goodness, you should have asked me 10 years ago. <laughs> I don't know how you begin doing that, but anyway, I told him, you can quite a plant on your hand there. But he saw me how pretty they were. So they're healthy. Okay. Um, Japonicas. Now, that's the big, the big ones. And they can get as wide as about seven inches across. Uh, especially your reticulatus. Now, you won't see a lot of them. You'll have to order them or go somewhere else in a different zone or something. And the North Carolina uh, state grows them and does, does a lot of experimenting and that kind of thing with reticulatus. Um, so uh, the species is just dominated the nursery trade. And so most of the time when you people, you say the word camellia, they think of japonica because they're the big showy flowers. And uh, but they go to shades of pink to deepest rose. Bloom sizes two inches across to seven. Uh, my mother had a three japonicas that were called debutante. And I think I've got a picture in here in just a minute of them. And the debutantes were nice pink ones, really thick and really pretty. And just they live for a long time. I don't know if y'all have cut yours and brought them inside, but they, they live pretty good while in, in a place. So, um, Try cutting them and enjoy them inside too. But they're they are stunning, I'm telling you. And that reticulata is they have nine inches across those flowers, blooms. So um 
red through the medium pink, some variegated with white, and you'll see the variegated too uh, here in, in some of the Japonicas too. Here are the forms, and uh, this is what you'll see most of the time. You can pretty well recognize. Uh, I've got a. I'll pass this around. And you can kind of, Excuse me. Got flowers to match the form, the uh, nemity form, and that I would say that uh, debutante form that I was telling you about is probably more like this one, the formal formal double. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. Here are some of the, here's that uh, Debbie talk right here. And it's got a little bit, you see this little bit of brown on the flower? I don't know if you can see it from back there. It has a little bit of brown. My mother used to worry to death about that. And I said, well, that's from frost. That's like a frost burn. And uh, she tried to cover them up, but you can see how big they are. <laughs> These were in front of her house. And I, I tried to trim them back, you know, proper time, and I did, but it was, it was about more than I could handle after they got so big. But anyway, this was another one she had, the Kramer Supreme. You'll see that around town. That's one that's pretty popular, too. And it's beautiful. And actually, this was at her house, and that one was down the road from my, where my brother lived in St. Elmo, and a lady's house, and I asked her if I could take a picture of it, you know, she was glad for me to take a picture, but look how big it is. It was out in the middle of her yard in the back. And then the camellia, I call that Terry just because of a friend of mine. Uh, that's actually a she she gashara. That's a popular one around here, too. <clears throat> here are the all those others, excuse me, were japonicas that you just looked at. These are all the same. And uh, oh, I've got that wrong. That was something else on that last one. Let me see. That one down there, that's more like a pink perfection, I think, rather than she should be short. Camellia Bonanza, Camellia Jean May, Camellia, because there's your she should be short. And then there's your Yule Tide. And then my no Yuki. You know, got a lot of names like that because they came from Japan. So. Okay, uh, just keep them from extremes of sunshine and wind. But I will say this, if I could find it. Uh, there's a neighbor of mine, I took a picture of his, okay. I took a picture of his uh, camellia one day and, uh, you know, close up to the bloom and then at a distance. He has it on the corner of his house. So what would he might get <laughs> if you have it on the corner of your house? You mean the wind. Yeah, the wind. So see, it's just like that lady said at Signal Mountain. You have to experiment. It just doesn't always work. I mean, or it does work. I mean, his, his that uh, camellia shrub it is, is huge. And it looks really pretty out there. Yes. Has the bone that's, that's underneath the stone. It's like the limb is here and the bone is right there underneath. It doesn't come out like all the rest of them. Ooh, I can think about that. I mean, we had that one. It was at the house where we lived there. We lived there 37 years. It was complete. It never got very big because it was a huge tree. Was it white? It and it tore them in, in January and February. Sometimes it was hard early in December, but the woods were on the trees. Huh. Uh, I don't think I've had one like that in the yard the way you're describing it. It's a Japonica, I can tell you that. It was already set out in it. It was just kind of spread. Yeah. But it was still there. She was asking about the size or a about the size of the type of camellia, and I can't identify uh, at the moment, but I'll, I'll get some thoughts of it. Uh, the, keep in mind the Japonica bloom after the Sasanquas. 
Okay. The sasequas bloom first and they start, they will start blooming. I always like to say, when you start seeing the moons, that's when the sasequas start now, start blooming. When the moons all come out, it's when the sasequas. And they'll bloom through December most of the time. And then the japonicas will start sometimes in December, sometimes earlier. I had one bloom earlier than that. And they will go all the way through April. So that's a long blooming season. And uh, that's that's what I like about them too. And that's most of the time when nothing else will bloom, which is good. You have some color. <clears throat> Uh, well drained again on the soil, you know, that's a kind of repeat for all of them. Um, not soggy, you know, don't let it sit in water. And, you know, and all this heat and everything, I had to really watch it because myself, uh, because I tend to water, I think, too much because I worry about them in that heat. But you have to be really careful, you know, to do that. And if you start seeing some changes in the leaves, turning and stuff like that. Make sure you don't have these camellias in total shade. Uh, they again, they need that sun, some sunlight to you know make their blooms and keep on blooming. So you don't want them in the hottest day. And I've got one that's in the hottest hour of the day. I'm probably going to have to move. It's moving and it's doing pretty well, but I'm worried about. It. And they, you know, along an east facing wall, even south or west, just trees or something blocking sun rays when hot. Under trees is okay. It's not dense shade or greedy roots. So if you don't want trees with greedy root, you know, that have greedy roots, take it up, you know, where you have your uh, camellias if that's what you choose to do. That's pretty right there. The best time to plant is when they're dormant. And when are they dormant? Anybody know? <laughs> when you go to the stores to buy one, they're usually blooming, aren't they? Because why would you go? I mean, this one isn't, of course. It's a too early. It's got the buds set on it. But Anyway, when you go and because you want to see the color, you know, it's nice to see it, what it's going to look like, that kind of thing. Well, that's when they're dormant, when they're blooming. So that's when you want to plant it. Plant it, you know, and, and I would advise you don't wait too long on planting. If you picked out a good site for it, that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, unlike most shrubs, camellias are dormant during flowering. And, uh, Clay soils offer the least friendly home for the roots, duh. That's not a hard to figure out, is it? Um, hillside might be okay. Get better than that drain on the hillside. Uh, good amounts of organic matter. You don't have to get real fancy with that. You know, your compost, good compost and, and uh, leaves and that kind of stuff uh, that will do well. Uh, don't plant too deep. Don't plant too deep on any of these, these plants here. You know, they're shallow rooted, but they need to have, you need to have that, that, um, that fall right at the top, even with the ground. Okay. Not way down. So watch, watch that. Don't get it too deep. Any of these. Roots grow out again, not down. So be sure, and then be sure to mulch. Fertilizing, be cautious and conservative. You've heard me say that already. Uh, fly after first year only. That's where that was on camellias. <laughs> and I haven't had to fertilize my camellias much. I really haven't. You know, I throw some off the on them every now and then. I haven't had to do too much of that kind of thing with them. Five reasons for brown spots on camellias. And uh, that actually, I thought I had changed it on my slide, but um, it's not, it's supposed to say or and leaves, not just bloom itself. Frost damage, we talked about that, cold tips. 
uh, sun scorch, uh, fierce summer sun like we've had this year, fierce summer, the burn the leaves, overwatering or waterlogged. <clears throat> If the soil sets, you know, too long, then you get the root rot. So be careful about that overwatering. Then leaf blight or fungal issues caused by prolonged wet periods times two. That that we won't say. Okay. And then camellias will get that. Where is that picture? Is that it right there of that yeah. gall? Yeah. That leaf gall. The uh, camellias will get this. I've never seen a camellia with this. I haven't had any ones I've grown, but this is really ugly looking, isn't it? It, it gets uglier than this, I can just tell you. I decided to leave that picture out. It's pretty gross, but it'll get uglier than this. But you cut it off. Remember, cut off that and dispose of it. Should, should be fine. Okay, you can do a it's foliar, and like I said, I have tried one. There's a hedge uh, and a bonsai. Uh, anybody see any bonsai done for me? I think there might have been one in our expo back in the spring, but I'm not sure. I know they had to say it's the bonsai, and they were absolutely beautiful. Couldn't believe it. Um, Somebody asked me a question earlier, and we were trying to get back to that. It was about the cold, wasn't it? So, Yes. Yes, you get a bigger enough one, you can keep azaleas in pots. Mm -hmm. I can't even share it. Or do you want to send it outside? Uh, does it get uh, light in there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be okay. Well, they live outside in the ground, okay, so I don't know why it wouldn't. Well, see, if it has good drainage, and that, it, you know, your pots, don't ever put plants in pots that don't have a drainage in the bottom. <laughs> Lessons learned, you know. Uh, be sure it has good drainage because, you know, you won't have to water it as much probably, but you have to give it to I'm just sorry about yeah, I have blueberries in pots, and they're on a roller. So during this Arctic freeze we had, I just shoved them up against the house because the house is going to protect them and give off that radiant heat. Just keep in mind, this they're they're talking about um, the they're talking about the uh, wintering in pots. And uh, I don't know if we have any feedback from the group here, but on that subject, because I don't have a lot of experience. I don't put a lot of, I have some pots in my yard of things, but it's not my camellias or azaleas. But now they grow, they put azaleas in pots at the zoo. When I work down there, I see them down there sometimes, and they're pretty healthy looking. Sure, they make faster. Now, I'm the one. Yeah. I grew up all together many times, and I put them, you know, I did some feed on something like that, something, you know, and I injected them, and I um, the leaves up around them. You know, and they remember the sun it all together, you know, and it's all they don't have. If they're not out from the air, it gets yeah. And it's, I think the air is the main They do. They, uh, Angel at the, the fig, the damn that fig frog today, she does that with her figs. Put them in, had them in pots and lose them in. I've got a big tree about so big and it's in a pot that you know, give it to our son and it's been in a pot for pot for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And like I've seen people even put their pearls. If long as the pot is big enough to let the roots expand, yeah, that's the. Mm -hmm. then, you know, yeah. But it's also the sun. So, I'm sure everything. 
the big box with that bubble that put on the inside. All you have to do is just have something that kind of protects from the, the cold wind or the ice getting in there and freezing on the roots. Uh, talking about protecting the plants in the winter. Um, I use a, uh, in fact, I ordered, I meant to bring it, and I apologize, I forgot it, but it's a, a, a cover for your plants, you know, your shrubs. And uh, you don't want to use plastic for, because um, that holds that, you know, when that moisture could still freeze the plant, but you can put, you know, drape an old sheet over it or something like that. Uh, don't, don't ever use, uh, you know, plastic or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but I covered up my camellias and my, uh, not my azaleas. I didn't cover them when that cold hit, but I covered up my, now I didn't cover them on the day, the most important day, the cold day. <clears throat> I covered them before that and after that. <laughs> Duh, but anyway, uh, it, it did help some, but, um, you know, the day of, I didn't have them covered. <laughs> So when you cover it, you do it cover it at night and then during the day when it's cold, you take the shower. Yeah, right before the dew falls, I can go out there and you know when it when it warms up, look, I wait till about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Then I take them off. We like a bunch of ghosts in my yard. Uh, the, this I have done before. Uh growing uh, camellias from your own cuttings it takes a lot of patience and you have to stay with it you really do um so i haven't been successful so far i am going to try again i just i have too many things going on i guess to you know draw my attention to that but i would love to be successful my mom is very successful at growing cuttings from gardenia and I wish I had some to bring for cuttings, but when we moved, it's kind of like those gardenias were left there and you know, one thing or another. But anyway, she I'm trying to get her to start some more. Uh, but you've got to have a pretty healthy gardenia too to get started. So working. Can you take a piece of the leaf? Or what is that exactly? You only want to leave two or three leaves at the top, and you want to cut by the leaf. Right above the leaf node, you know, and uh, put some root, you know, rooting hormone on it. Dip it, or sometimes it, you know you can buy powder too, but whatever. Put some of that in there, and then put it in a pot. And you can transfer from small pots to, to a larger pot eventually. But if you want it to grow. It's going to take a while just to root. It a long while. <laughs> Yeah, and you have to keep them covered. I, I, I apologize, I forgot all the details, but there's a lot more to it than what that looks like. Um, you have to kind of you have to really protect them. Can you do it in a Yes. <laughs> yeah, that would make sense. I got to give me a mini one. <laughs> okay. Uh, some of you may live out where uh, deer like to roam around and eat your flowers, and they like to make it spit. And so the only thing I've researched is to maybe plant lavender in between the plants and around, and they don't, they, I don't know if they completely hate lavender or if it deters them, but here's some other suggestions. Rosemary, lavender, and the California sagebrush, they're not a favorite of deer, so well, when deer get hungry enough, guess what? Yeah. They eat roses and thorns. They don't. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, I have to know. So, um, they, they do love to me, but that, uh, that Bob X stuff is one of those ones. It's a uh, liquid fence. So it's EX, and I'm telling you, it, it really works. It's okay. So Say the name of it again. Lowe's or Tractor Supply, a product called Liquid Fence. D-O-B-B-E-S. X, excuse me, X. 
They're resistant to what we're talking about. That's good to know. Okay, rabbit resistance, didn't you say? <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, you, you want to be kind of careful. Uh, any, if you have dogs, or, you know, make sure they don't get in. I know Dr. Uh, what's Mickey's last name? Myers. Yeah, Mickey Myers. He's a master gardener. He's a vet, veterinarian. Uh, I think it was this product, yeah, Polyton. That he he said, be careful. It has some, you know, uh, gets a little bone meal or something like that. He said, be careful because dogs will be attracted to that sometimes. But you know, put that on your plants. Just kind of watch your animals. Mine has got her mind, my attention to go messing around with it, looking for that. Uh, yeah. But anyway, that's just a suggestion if you have, like you said. Okay, this was kind of interesting back in when I was researching oral millions in the beginning and all. And uh, this guy, who have you all heard of Red Barber? Y'all remember him? Red Barber, uh, he's deceased or now, but he he was a he loved baseball and he was a baseball guest call commentator and uh, and. So he did that for a long time, and uh, the guy with him, Bob, was a radio uh, commentator on NPR for a long time. I think he still does segments, but not a regular. But anyway, he, uh, Bob, would, in, would call Red up every Friday. It was called Fridays with Red, and he wanted to talk about baseball. So... The colonel, they call him, they call him Colonel Bob, and the redhead is, because uh, he is redheaded, Bob, Red Barber. He lives in Tallahassee, lived in Tallahassee, Florida. He had a yard, a backyard full of pavilions. And so they would, he would get Red on the phone, and he'd want to talk about baseball, and Red would immediately talk about the weather and his pavilions. And he had to get that out of the way, and then he would say something about baseball. But it was like that every Friday, and I used to love to tune in and listen. And so eventually, he was pre presented. Red Barber was for his familiar um, love uh, certificate from the American Chameleon Society. They recognized him. So, <clears throat> all right, we let's see. I want to turn back to uh, before we before we get there. Uh, talk a minute about uh, that cold day. Okay. Keep in mind that was very not normal. Not normal. We don't have another one like that. I mean, we're the, we're just shot down the temperature so quickly. Um, so I got calls about familiars. People told me about their They said, what we do, we do. It's mine's turned all brown and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, or leaves off of it and said, don't do anything right now. So don't ever jump the gun and start whacking it down, okay? Whatever plan. Leave it for a little while. I know it looks bad, but leave it. It's best to leave it. Camellia, this, if, if you go out and buy a camellia, what are you going to pay? Anybody know? Yeah, close to $50. Uh, uh, Ace Hardware, end of season, has them a little cheaper. <laughs> I know that because that's where I bought a lot because we put some down the zoo. But, um, you know, wherever, I mean, it's still expensive. Even $30 is expensive for a plant. So you want to try to save them if you can. And uh, like that picture I passed around, you saw how full that yuletide looked before that. And then after... You didn't see the after picture, but it had no leaves whatsoever. No leaves on it. Right beside it was a camellia called, and both of them are succinquas. Remember, japonicas are a little more cold party, but the succinquas are peak tar. Right beside it was a camellia that I love called snow flurry. 
and it produces millions of buds on it. I mean, if you think if you see that out somewhere, you'll love it. But that one was all green and nice. It was right beside the Yuletide. The Yuletide had no leaves, and the other one was green during that cold day. So you just never know. And I don't know what makes it tick that way. I really don't. So um, keep in mind, don't whack them down. Wait, give it a little time. The, the, the best thing to do after you've waited a couple months and you see some green coming back and you can trim it down some, but don't trim it, you know, don't yank it out or all the way down to the ground. Give it some space for a while. So you'll be glad you did. Okay. Now we're going to get a little bit, just a little bit about gardenias. Am I doing okay on time? Okay. What did you, what was the plant of the biggest? They're evergreen. Yes. Um, okay. This, uh, I'm going to pass this around and I want you to look at it and see if you can identify. Oh, I left out one important. I'll tell you that you'll guess which is which. <laughs> no, it's all right. These are leaves from all of these plants, including rhododendron. I picked two off my rhododendron. So you pick out and identify which is which. But I will tell you this. Another way you can identify a camellia is the leaves are serrated. They're always on the Sasanko and the on all of them, they're serrated. Okay, that's one way you can tell. You can walk up to the plant, look at the leaf. That's a chameleon. So keep that as rhythm. I'll pass this around too. And this is this is what I was telling you about. These are real That's like no flurry. Okay. A little bit about gardenias. Gardenias of any one of these plants are the most iffy plant. Gardenias. gardenias um, did you get them to live in, you say Florida? Yeah. Yeah. Someone told me that they had them in Florida and, and uh, that they did very well. And you said they did well in Texas. So, yes. So, now, one, one unique thing about Florida is opposite of what it is in Texas, or at least parts of Texas, it's humid. And they love humidity. So keep that in mind. But it was humid. But see, it wasn't for somebody from Tennessee. It was dry to me. I'll lose Wait, it. Yes. Yep. yep. All of these, though, yeah. Yeah, they might. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's getting on up to the room. That's that's closer, that's a little bit more, getting a little bit closer to uh, where Tallahassee, where he had the camellias. Halfway, yeah. Okay. And at Gardenia's, they are so fragrant. I absolutely love these flowers. Just cut off a couple, and like I said, I did. You can, you can pass this around. Can you smell it from here? Um, they're attractive, they're fragrant, they're beautiful. They got the shiny dark leaves like the camellia does. And uh select a site with full sun to light shade. Uh, make sure the soil is moist. Where have we heard that? They're pretty. And uh they need about an inch of rain. This is the one that they said it's good to go out and miss them. This, this, this stem, yeah, that's a good plant to do that with. And uh, 
Anyway, pretty much everything stays the same about that, the organic mulch. You know, you can put, it uh, says distilled water once a week. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Do they, they do like full sun? Well, they will and they won't. Here again, it's experimenting. I have a good friend that lives in Red Bank, and I got one of her, uh, her was it gardenias from her. Took forever to dig it up. It was on a slope, but it was in full sun. And it had, it was a different type. It wasn't this dark green. It was a lighter green. So there's two, there's two different kinds, or maybe more, but anyway. So whatever you choose, you know, it, it may take the sun. See, that one took the sun. But now I transferred it, transplanted it over to my yard where I used to live, out on the side of my house, and it had more shade from then on. And it didn't bloom that first next year after I planted it, but it did after that. Started getting blooms. That's a different plant. Yeah. It has a little slender, long slender leaf, doesn't it? I think I think it does. That's yeah, it does, doesn't it? Because the leaves are longer than your huge. Uh, it doesn't say it is, it just says, uh, it'll get three, four feet high. So that's about right. But now, my brother, let me say hello, he did live, excuse me, he's deceased, but he has at his house, I think it's four gardenia plants. And they are this tall. It's it's and I have asked people, and, and they and say they're this, but nobody knows what it is. Okay, I would try asking Linda. Yes, that's what I'm thinking. Is it going to be too? Yeah, and said they have two different types, or one was. Yeah, and the one you could plant it outside, but the other one you definitely have to bring inside. You couldn't plant it outside. I didn't ask you about gardenias because we were talking about gardenias. And it had she said it was more shade tolerant. I don't remember what it was, but it was full of them. Uh, yeah, that you know, always check with somebody there, especially if they're you know, you can find that somebody that's pretty knowledgeable. Uh, sometimes you know you have to find the right person, but but anyway, uh, these are very tender. Like I said, they're iffy, and you have to really treat them, good. treat them with care. Um, they were used in Asia for herbal medicines. The yellow fruit used to make a dye color for food and clothing. Gardenias were named after Alexander Garden, <laughs> the Scottish born American naturalist. Um, they need more attention. Linda said that too. I do remember saying that. They're the iffiest of all of them. Um, oh, they do. I, they don't transplant well. I found that out. It suffers too much in direct sun. Consider planting in spring or fall, but prior to six weeks before frost. So if you go run out and get one now, and get it planted. Protect from cold winds. Here we go with the winds again. In morning sun, late afternoon shade, they grow best in temps between 65 and 70. And how often do we get 65 and 70? <laughs> Coming up, maybe. <laughs> Remove the flowers to encourage more blooms. And by the way, um, you know, I, I pick up the faded, you know, the wood crops or, or faded ones pretty often on all my zayas and all that. And hopefully, hopefully that encourages more blooms and they keep blooming. So I guess that's working. But um, prune only to keep that out of shape. I don't know anybody. I, I, don't, I haven't seen anybody prune 
gardenia. Never saw my brother prune his, that's for sure. Uh, slow release uh, fertilizer, if you're going to use a fertilizer, and I would say these need a fertilizer, right. if anything. Uh, bud drop can be caused by low humidity, over or under watering again, insufficient light, so many things you have to just experiment. Uh, and again, back to my mother, uh, four inch cutting, you know, if you've got a mature one you can cut from, and she did at the time, and she was giving plants to everybody. They grow a lot faster, a lot faster than to me, believe me. There's no, no comparison. Uh, so just dip it in that rooting one, and that's what she would do, put it in a little pot, put it in, and she'd move it to a bigger pot, and then she'd put it in the ground. Okay, a uh, little bit of uh, powdery mildew. It thrives in 60 to 80 degree dry climates. Needs high humidity to spread, and if cooler and rainy, it does not spread. That's just weird to me. Yeah, I know. Um, how recent? I wrote a little thing. Thank you. Uh, I do have a. Uh, want to jot this down? One. This is a uh, spray for the powdery mildew. One tablespoon of baking soda with one tablespoon of vegetable oil and one teaspoon of dish soap, and make sure your dish soap is, uh, you know, eco-friendly. Uh, one tablespoon of baking soda with one tablespoon of vegetable oil and one teaspoon of dish soap in one gallon of water. And another one they suggest too, and that's for spraying on your plants if they get this powdery mildew. And if and another one they suggest is mix two to three tablespoons of vinegar with one gallon of water. And then another one, <laughs> Mix one part milk with 10 parts water milk. So anyway, you do it early in the day. You don't want to do it at night because you don't want to have that moisture on there overnight because you get the dew added to that. So uh, snip off infected leaves in lower areas of, you know, any kind of areas that have been infected on the plant. Always snip off. Don't, you know, don't feel bad about that. Check for white flies and mealybugs using a horticultural oil. Um, you see anything like that? I haven't seen any. Uh, cut flowers, just a suggestion. Try not to touch the blossoms with your bare hands and uh, cut at a 45 degree angle to help absorb water into that water in the water. Uh, remove the bottom leaves so no leaves are below the water. Do that pretty much with most. Add a tablespoon of sugar and a teaspoon of bleach to the water in the medium size base. Hopefully. Other tips, wrapping up here. As always, I want to encourage you to garden with pollinators. So you have to, you can't just you know, have these in your yard. You got to have other things that attract pollinators. Now, when they bloom and the blossoms, yeah, they get the nectar from the blossoms of the camellia and the rhododendron and things like that. But as far as butterflies, that's only one, that's helping them with one stage of their, of what they need. You know, they're, they need a host plant. So I want to encourage you. I, I think I would, wouldn't be a, a good master gardener if I didn't encourage you. Just don't leave it here. You know, have other plants, a variety in your yard um, to attract butterflies, bees, and all that. And, and they're there, but uh, I also read somewhere where if you if you put in one plant, like I put in bee, bee balm in my back little garden, because it's got a variety of plants. Um, and so I got another bee ball. I thought, I don't need just one bee ball. There might be bees wanting to share, you know, <laughs> and they can't all get on one. So they do encourage you to have more than one flower, you know, like their salvia, you know, you're going to have a, a lot of that. So I know Jackie emphasizely grows, Jackie Becker grows that salvia really well. It's one of my favorites. Um, you know, 
uh, choose a variety that will bloom throughout the growing season and plants with foliage that feed insect larva and uh, attractive range of pollinators, because that's what you want. And make sure your garden, your sun garden, has six hours of direct sunlight to benefit pollinators and you'll get more blooms. Don't put a bird feeder in this garden because then the, it gets kind of labeled as a buffet for birds. So you're now, what's that? Yeah, yeah, and squirrels. You're exactly right. Uh, okay, I'm going to say something about Rosa Sharon because I like Rosa Sharon. Now, they're a member of the hibiscus family. You all know that, right? Okay, because they look just like the hibiscus you go and pay a lot of money for. Where my mom lived in McDonald, Tennessee, for 50 years nearly, she had these Rosa Sharon's growing. I don't know how they started. They may have been, one may have been there, and then they, you know, but it does not take any effort for them to multiply. <laughs> so wherever you put them, use sparingly because Rosa Sharon's and these butterfly bushes, they will displace native, other native plants that are out there growing. Because she had her Rosa Sharon's on the edge next to the woods. And they multiplied, got really, I think they were probably 20 feet high when we she sold that house. The Rosa Sharon's absolutely gorgeous, beautiful every you know summer looking all the way through fall. But but she did not allow them, you know, to stay mowed right in front of them. She did not allow them in her yard, you know, where she had other type of plants and all. But just keeping butterfly bushes, they will they will spread and um, butterfly bush, it's called a butterfly bush. But again, does it provide a butterfly? It's not a host plant. So it's not helping that butterfly in the beginning stages. It only gives them a little nectar. You know, they buzz by and get the nectar, which that's good in bees and all that. But just, you got to have host plants around. So keep that in mind. And Rosa Sharon and the butterfly bush is on uh, UT's invasive list. Uh -huh. So that's why we really, you know, do it with control. Don't do like the lady across the street from me, I have discovered. She has, I was walking my dog on the sidewalk and I looked over in her yard and she had little bitty Rosa Sharon's all along the yard. It's pretty. And she keeps them about this high. In the back, her whole backyard's lined with Rosa Sharon's all over the place. I mean, I've never seen so many really. What, what spot um but that's you know that's what she enjoys and so uh but you know don't forget about your butterflies and your bees and animals, um because it's important to have it, it for scale uh we talked about that a little bit just use your horticulture and you can also get a q-tip dipped in alcohol if you have to be really diligent getting to the spot on the insect you need to get to. Uh, and it had they're kind of a grayish, almost got a little armor coating on the on the insect. So <laughs> get that al alcohol and Q-tip under there to get them, but you can pick them off. Um, don't use neem oil on herbs. You know, that's a pretty good product, I guess, but be sure you don't use it because it, they cause burn. Uh, sanitize your pruning tools. Sometimes we don't think about that enough, but if we're out cutting a disease away from a plant or something, you need to sanitize your tools. Um, very early on in the, the Master Gardener class, they said, you know, be sure and sanitize your locker when you cut the brown out of the leaving sockets. I don't know if y'all familiar with that, but you transfer the disease if you don't from branch to branch. What's that? What? Uh, just just a leech. Leech or alcohol? Yeah, yeah you use alcohol or leech. Just mix it up in a bottle or use the one already ready. Um, uh, 
Yeah, you'll see uh, on those hydrangeas. I think I mentioned this. You can use coffee on coffee grounds on those too. I've heard some people put it on there and turn them bluer, but, but anyway. Nematodes feed on the outer surface of the plant while others burrow into tissues. And uh, soil dwellers are most common beneficial nematodes feed on decaying material. So that's a good thing. Uh, insects or other nematodes will feed on insects on them, themselves. So brown spots on plants could be a deficiency of phosphorus. And uh, so put in some manure if you have that available. Uh, not dog manure. Uh, <laughs> uh, people have this thing about that, and they think leaving it on the ground on the ground is good for the grass. No, no, it goes it goes to our water. I used to do I used to preach this in my workplace because it environment and don't do that. Just pick it up and just go to veggie. <laughs> right. Uh, bone meal, some of those things, you know, you can kind of look up, just Google if your plant's doing something, see if it needs iron, it's an iron deficiency or what it is. Um, you know, they have a bit oxygen. So am I getting close here now? Uh what about the things back there on the table? Okay. I also have a Oh, one more thing. Whatever you decide to grow, be sure you consider the place, soil, and growth of the plant. Research the plant that interests you. Get to know your backyard. I say this all the time. Your backyard, your whole yard. Get to know what's in your yard, what insects you have, what's affecting what. Um, you don't know what runs through all the time, but you know, how many butterflies or birds come by, that kind of thing. Trees are the most important plants in your yard. The shrubs are next. And then you've got your flowers that you want to attract, butterflies and, and so on. Uh, remember, when you purchase a one-gallon container, think about how big that's going to get. That should be part of your research, okay? And uh, because in four years, it can be a lot larger. You'll go, oh, my goodness, what have I done? And uh, so... The sooner the better. Keep plants moist in the shade. Remember, you can't, you can't plant them right away. And have fun. Get all that packed in. You have fun. <laughs> Thank you. Just uh, I want to remind people that the presentation is available for you to review on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. All you have to do is search for Master Gardeners of Hampton County, Tennessee. So you can go back at a later date if you want to re review. Okay. Okay. You'll be able to see it on YouTube. Yeah, you'll be able to see it up there. Yeah. Master Gardeners of Hampton County, Tennessee. Yeah. I'll tell you about this book right here. I found it in the case. Y'all ever go to the case? You can get some good gardening books there. Really good. If you don't buy them anywhere else, buy them. Oh, cheaper anyway. But this I picked up just because of the title, The Lazy Gardener. Yeah, I'm find out how you have to be to get something done. This thing, you know what it's about? It's about organizing. If you're very organized, then you I guess you can call yourself a lazy gardener. That's, that's the whole premise behind it. It's got some really good tips in it, but man, I was kind of shocked because I expected to find like it was a joke, you know, but it wasn't. So the more organized you are. And I have something for you, a couple of handouts about the and actually, Carol, uh, if they want to stay, I know you need to read. We'll talk to all. Just give us a minute here. Uh, we're, we're going to have some door prizes, and we've got the gentleman who's brought some things to give us today, and we've got some things to do afterwards. But we're going to dismiss our Zoom people and thank them for being here today. And that will be all that we will be broadcasting for. And they've gone to stay just a few more minutes for some door prizes. And so thank you all, Jim.
Dude, I will tell the people here today and also on Zoom, next month is the program is on your plants that are safe to be with your pets. So this is very what she mentioned earlier about the bone wheel and some things can be dangerous to use around your plants. So we have a speaker next next month that's going to talk to us about the things to be safe for our pets. They're our family too. And so we want to be sure to take care of that's our program next in October. So good night to the people. Thank you for attending. Now for the people that are here.